here at Harbor Branch. But for now, we are connecting with you. environmental issues in the Indian River Lagoon. So many of you know about Erlon, our Indian River Lagoon Observatory Network of Environmental Sensors. This year, working during the pandemic, we've made considerable enhancements of our network. One of these is the addition of new sensors to better address emerging water quality issues in the Indian River Lagoon, in particular, harmful algal blooms and coastal acidification. So I hope you can attend that lecture. Also, I want to call your attention to the screen that's kept up because some, some people will still be joining us. You may have read it earlier in our pre-show slides. <laughs> but the main difference in terms of asking questions is just go ahead and enter your question during the lecture when the lecture is finished um, in the Q&A section. And I actually will be monitoring that. And then uh, we will have time at the end for questions to our speaker. So let's, let's see how that works out. And uh, also, if you have any questions uh, afterwards, you can always contact me at any time. Okay. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shirley Pomponi. She is, of course, no stranger to the series, being one of our most uh, regular contributors. Among other things, Shirley is an ocean explorer. In some of her previous le lectures, she's taken us to some very interesting far away places. So for example, um, Lake Baikal, uh, most recently the reefs around Cuba. Shirley grew up in New Jersey, came to Florida, received her PhD from the University of Miami. She joined Harbor Branch in 1984, and from 1992 to 2002, she directed our Division of Biomedical Marine Research. Shirley then became our first Vice President of Research before becoming our President and CEO in 2004. When Harbor Branch joined FAU, Shirley served as executive director until 2009, and then was executive director for the NOAA Co-Offic Institute for Ocean Exploration, Research and Technology based here at Harbor Branch. Shirley is a sponge biologist. She has led numerous research expeditions worldwide and has logged more than 300 scientific submersible dives. She served on a number of prestigious national scientific committees thanks to her considerable breadth of talent and experience. Last year, uh, Shirley conducted a mission in the Aquarius Underwater Habitat, an item that had been on her bucket list for a long time. And talk about taking us to faraway places. Her Aquarius mission um, was focused on training astronauts to explore space. So today, Shirley will share this bucket list item in her lecture, Nemo 23, Simulating space exploration in a real life undersea environment. Thanks, Dennis. And welcome everyone to the first of our virtual ocean science lectures. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dennis, very much for that uh, nice introduction. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining today uh, virtually. Uh, this is our first, I think, virtual ocean science lecture. Um, I don't know if many of you remember, but I was supposed to give a lecture, well, first back in July, January and then in March. And just when I was supposed to give the lecture in March, uh, everything closed down for uh, because of the pandemic. So. Here I am, um, about a year and a half now after our 
um, NEMO mission and everything, everything good? Yeah, okay. So I had the opportunity um, about two years ago, I think it came up, thanks Wyatt. I had the opportunity uh, about two years ago to start working on um, this exploration project with NASA called the uh, NASA, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. And um, I just through a series of connections um, was invited to participate in NEMO 23. So the NASA Extreme Environments Mission Operations has been going on, have been going on for 22 years and, and I got to participate in NEMO 23. So I'm gonna just spend some time with you today talking about uh, NEMO 23, what it's all about. We did a lot of things. As I was going through my slides, it was kind of fun uh, going through my pictures, uh, remembering uh, th that whole experience. Uh, I had literally about 150 slides. Don't worry, I weaned it down a lot. Um, but as a result, we're only, I'm only gonna be focusing on a few things that we did, but I'm gonna give you an overview of everything that we did. But let's start out with, um, with, with NEMO itself. It's what's called an analog mission. So an analog mission is, is, a, is um, a mission for NASA that's Earth-based, but it produces effects on the human body uh, similar to those that you would experience in space. And so that's the way they set these up. And so there's, there are some that they do in the desert. There are some that they, they, you know, they do in caves. There are these ones that they do underwater. So these are effects that we're testing, physical effects on, the, on humans, um, mental, emotional effects, how you, how you uh, interact with a number of people in closed settings. For me, it was kind of easy on this because we've been going out to sea for a long time. And so I'm used to being in a you know, small environment, you know, small space with lots of people. Um, but this was a lot smaller and no, I don't get claustrophobic. So that was also, um, that was also a, a positive. So groups of astronauts and engineers and scientists live in Aquarius, uh, which is the world's only undersea research station um, for up to two or three weeks at a, at a time. So Aquarius and the surroundings around Aquarius provide a, uh, a meaningful analog for space exploration and they help um, the work that, that we did and the results that come from that really help NASA to evolve their plans for uh, exploration and long duration um, space exploration. All right, so what's Aquarius? So Aquarius is an underwater research habitat. I mentioned it's the only one in the world. It's located in the Florida Keys, about five miles off of, actually off of Tavernier. Um, and it's in the Florida Keys uh, National Marine Sanctuary. And it's, oops, sorry, can we go back one? Um, can we go back one? Yeah, there we go. Um, and uh, it's uh, about 60 feet of water on Conk, Conk Reef, and it's operated by Florida International University. And so um, you can see, let me see if I can, yeah, oh, good, my mouse works. Uh, let me go, where am I? I don't want to go up to that upper, sorry, I'll tell you what. So in the upper right, you can see a buoy, and that's the life support buoy, and that's what provides power, air, um, internet connections um, to the habitat. And I'll, the story about the, in fact, the reason we, we were supposed to actually do this mission in 2018, we ended up doing it in 2019 because um, Hurricane Irma, I believe it was, uh, really hit the Florida Keys badly in 2017. And this life support buoy detached from the mooring and, and was actually pushed inshore and into a bridge. And it had to be repaired and it took a long time to repair, longer than what the FIU um, Aquarius staff you know, anticipated. And we were kind of down to the wire. Are we gonna do it in 2018? Are we gonna do it in 2018? And it just didn't work out. They were in fact waiting for some mooring lines to come in, I believe from Germany. So we ended up postponing it till 20, 2019. Um, but you can see in the images um, in this uh, slide, um, images of the Aquarius habitat and those divers that are diving in there, one of them is me and the other three are three of my crewmates um, in for Nemo 23. Back one, thanks. So this is a view inside the habitat. 
looking, uh, and that's Samantha Cristoforetti. Um, she's a European Space Agency astronaut and our commander for this mission. And that's looking towards the wet porch um, as you're looking um, in, in that direction. And you can see it's, it's a small space, really small space. And on the right-hand side, you can see our, our kitchen and uh, up in that shelf on the top are our food. All the way on the left-hand side are all the instrument controls, many of which are the things that keep us alive down there. And I might, you know, and then looking in the other direction, so they're looking towards um, the uh, other end of Aquarius habitat. And that big porthole that you see all the way at the back, that was in our, that's in the you know, area where the bunk room, where we slept, all six of us slept there. Um, and the table, uh, that's our one work table, eating table, whatever we needed to do, and some, some bench space as well. So small quarters, um, had to keep everything neat and clean and everything in its place. Okay, so why, you know, how, how are these analog missions? So NEMO um, is, is uh, the Aquarius is our spacecraft, kind of like the International Space Station. And, um, what, and what the aquanauts, my crewmates were wearing, were hard hat helmets that were uh, an analog, a good dive, hel dive helmet is a good analog for the helmets that the astronauts are wearing and that NASA is developing as, the, as these, um, you know, it was the, equipment, the helmets, the, the suits all evolve. So they're learning a lot from these missions on, on exactly what's needed, what works, what doesn't work. So this was, um, this was our crew. Um, we ladies like to say it was an all-female crew, but NASA always corrected us because it wasn't. So um, the two, uh, actually you see three men in this picture. Um, and so going from uh, left to right, you can see me, I'm on the far left. And then um, Mark uh, Otter, Halsbeck, it was one of the Aquarius technicians keeping us, uh, making sure everything was working properly down there. And then Samantha Cristoforetti, an astronaut with the European Space Agency. Uh, Chilla Ari uh, D'Agostino, who's a scientist, a marine scientist and a, a physiologist from University of South Florida. Jessica Watkins uh, at the time was uh, an astronaut candidate, but has since graduated and she's now an, an astronaut. Tom Horn next to her is the other um, habitat technician. He works for FIU. And then on looking at the screen on the far right is um, Adam Nade. So Adam was our alternate. So if anything happened to any of us, Adam would have taken our place. So he went through all of the training that we went through and was, you know, was you know, a, me a member of our crew. And again, here's a picture of us in those really nifty white um, dive uh, suits, wet suits, which we didn't get to keep. Um, and um, again, just images of us diving down onto the Aquarius habitat, um, the customary pose outside of the habitat. Uh, and the, the two guys are on the inside looking out because they went down before we did and then uh, getting in uh, through the wet porch area. Okay, so there's a lot on this slide. I don't expect you to read it. It's just to remind me to tell you what, what NASA was hoping to accomplish during, uh, during NEMO 23. So they were looking at new ways for a diver augmented um, vision display. So that would project out and be able to provide um, information back to mission control. So, um, they were also, we also tested a new um, support system for um, an, an IV or an intravehicular workstation. I'll show you an image of that later. And digital cue cards, which were pretty cool. Um, and I'll show you those later as well. And then in terms of tools and equipment, I spent a lot of time, um, probably one of the most fun things we did was tool development. And I um, had the opportunity to work with some really talented engineers at NASA's um, Johnson Space Center. Um, Adam Nades was one and Mary Walker was the other and working on developing specific tools. And so working on tools for um, collecting samples, mostly focused on geological samples, but some of the tools we were using were ones that were analogous to collecting geological samples. And then um, a modular equipment transportation system, METS or a wheelbarrow. Um, and, um, and then in terms of concepts of operations or CONOPS, looking at integrating um, EVA or extravehicular activities 
with the science tasks. And this was the first time that they, in fact, one of the reasons I was invited was because I had proposed a science, a science task, a science mission. And so they've never had a situation where the scientist whose uh, experiment was being, was being tested was actually either on the space station, in the spacecraft, or for that matter, in Aquarius for any of the previous NEMO missions. So they were really interested in, NASA was really interested in seeing how that would work, having the scientist whose science it was that was being you know, performed, conducted during the mission, having the scientist actually there uh, being able to give commands rather than getting them always from mission control. So we had a number of IVA or intravehicular activities as well. So we tested um, different uh, medical scenarios using augmented uh, reality. Um, we tested um, programs for exercising because exercising is really important and trying to, and I'll, and I'll give you an example of that later as well, but how to encourage the astronauts in space to, to exercise. Um, we had a really cool scanning electron microscope, which I'm very happy to say um, Chris Own at, um, uh, has, uh, at Vox has uh, let us borrow in our lab here at FAU for a few months. Um, and location tracking. So you saw the inside of the habitat. It's, it's small, it's cramped. You can't be leaving stuff all around. You have to stow things away. And so we were testing a system where we could put RFIDs on everything and then we could monitor where things were. So it's like, hey, where's that underwater camera? You can go in um, in the spreadsheet, find out where we put it, you know, in Shirley's locker or in, you know, Chilla's, you know, near Chilla's bed or underneath the, the, the table, something like that. And believe me, we used that. That was really important too. Um, and also, oh, I almost forgot, on the far left was something that I really enjoyed using. It's called Playbook, but it's, um, it's a scheduler. And I'll get, go into a little bit more detail on that, but it's a scheduler to be able to track exactly what you're doing, tell you what you're supposed to be doing, when, how much time you have to do that. Okay, and then we had a few more activities that were sponsored by P other principal investigators, other scientists. So um, University of South Florida and the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition were testing different um, protocols monitoring our sleep, our psychology, what was happening mentally while we were in that, you know, doing extravehicular activities or in the closed quarters, um, metabolomics, different, uh, we had blood tests, saliva tests, we had taste tests, things like that. Um, cogn team cognition, how we interacted well with everyone else. Um, some of the really cool um, tests that we did involved psychomotor coordination, being able to uh, you know, think and do something at the same time. Um, and one of my favorites that I'll give you, go into more detail on was um, what was called the real-time performance monitor, or I like to call it the lunar lander. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so here's Playbook. Playbook, um, and we had lots of, of uh, tablets down there. Everybody had an iPad or some other kind of tablet. And we worked from those. We were not at a loss for any kind of, um, you know, digital technologies down there. That some that we brought of our own, and some that were provided. So Playbook was developed to um, be able to view the the plan of the day or the plan of the week and execute those plans, and then be able to modify those plans. And in fact, this was the first time um, that the astronauts or the aquanauts were able to independently. Um, move some tasks around. They call that flexicution. But typically, if we wanted to do something a little bit differently or a different, different time, uh, we would communicate with mission control uh, in the evening, have a meeting and say, well, you know, this worked out okay today, but we need a little bit more time for that tomorrow, stuff like that. So um, you'll see on the right side of that um, tablet screen, there's kind of like a black bar and you could click on that. If you were doing something, say for example, I was doing, uh, real-time performance monitor. I wanted to get instructions on how to do that. You click on that in, the, in the, that black area and it brings up your um, instructions on how to do that. So really, really helpful. And it could also be set up so that it's set up for say Martian time. We were on lunar time, which is like a two second delay. But I think the year, either the year before, or maybe two years before, they were on Martian time, which is kind of challenging because you've got a many minute delay, you know, minutes delay between communications. 
And this is just an example. So for each one of those rows, that's each person in the crew. So each one of us had our own row and we were supposed to be tracking that. And that red vertical line is kind of what the time is and where you are on that time. And you look at that and say, oh, geez, I'm behind time on that. So for the first few days, we were like really worried about that. But then afterwards, we kind of flexed, flexed around that and we were able to get everything done. And that was how, and I, this was exactly what NASA was hoping to achieve with, you know, with this playbook um, uh, function, to be able to say, this is how much time I need for this activity. Uh, or we don't need as much, or you know, you can't schedule two things at the same time because we only have one monitor for this particular exercise. So it was really, really helpful. Another thing that was really helpful were, the, were cue cards. And this is what you would see on another um, tablet or iPad. And each one of those little um, boxes you could click on. In fact, I'm going to go to that right now and show you. You can click on that. And this is when we were in training at the Johnson Space Center. You could click on that and it would take you to an, some, some other function. So for example, if you wanted to know what coral it was that you were looking at, or in my case, what sponge it was, and I wanted to tell the aquanauts who were out doing the EVA, you know, go and look at the, the you know, sponge IDs and they could click on that on the cue cards and they say, oh yes, okay, this is, I know this is, you know, what, what you want me to collect, Shirley. So real, very, very helpful. Again, instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the instruments, how to use the devices. However, I will say that, um, and, and the, the, the aquanauts were juggling, you know, sometimes two or even three of these tablets trying to go back and forth. And so one of the functions that I, you know, one of the roles I played inside was to be able to talk them through. So if, you know, they were performing a function and it, you know, in some cases it was maybe 14 steps or even longer, I would say, okay, next step, do this. And so I'd be talking to the, the aquanauts while they were doing their work. So, but the cue cards were great. These are kind of like takeaways that I brought back with me from this mission for how we could apply these to ocean science and you know, diving and things. So it really was a kind of a two-way street in terms of the technology transfer as well. Okay, so let's go through a day in the life of NEMO EVA or extravehicular activity operations. We'll start with the uh, in the upper left. So you get suited up, you get your helmet on. And this is usually like, it takes about an hour for all of this to happen. Get in the water, you start exploring the zones that, um, that, were, that we mapped out for that day that we were gonna explore. And, you know, could, uh, and again, they could look on, the, on their cue cards and see the map and see where they are in relation to that map. And then they kind of throw down some tags. Again, a nice take home that I got from that, although I couldn't get to keep the tags, was kind of being able to mark where the samples were that they wanted to go back to. And these were big tags that they could put on, um, you know, on the coral or on the sponge. And throughout all of this, in the lower right-hand corner, you see a lot of kind of like a flow chart there. There's a lot of talking going back and forth. Uh, the, the, I was on, in fact, the very first day, very first dive, I was on dive, I was like dive control. So I had to kind of communicate back and forth between the science fan and mission control, sometimes the, the dive operations back to the, back to the aquanauts, back to the divers. Um, they would, uh, then moving over then to the left, the lower, uh, the, the lower right, but moving to, over to the left from the, that, that bottom area they would do the data collection, regardless of what it was. We had different things going on every day. There were two, usually two dives per day and the dives lasted a long time, three or four hours. Um, finish their data collection, uh, curate the samples. So preserve the samples that they had to or somehow, you know, get those samples put together and then get back in um, the habitat. So that, you know, all together would take maybe four or five hours. So a sizable chunk of the day, we had long days. Um, this is a picture of the, the workstation for the dive operations, lots of computers. And this next one I'm gonna show, there I am. I think this may have even been on the first day. And so you'll see um, directly in front of me was a, is a screen that has um, three uh, images on it. So I could see, there were three cameras I could see what each one of the, there are two divers, I could see what each one of the divers was looking at because there was a, a helmet mounted uh, camera 
Um, and so I could see exactly what they were seeing. And so sometimes if they wanted me to see something, they say, okay, Shirley, what do you, what, you know, what do you think this is? And they put their head down and I could see what they could see. Um, but directly below those images, the videos, um, is what looks like it may be a spreadsheet. And that's where I was rec also recording samples that were being collected, or I was dictating it back to the shore base team. And they were, uh, they were also, and they were also um, recording all of the data. On the right-hand side, that kind of vertical monitor, you can see the playbook. So where we're supposed to be at that point in time. So I'm constantly looking at that and saying, okay, we're halfway through the EVA and we haven't completed all of the tasks. You got to, you know, okay, make a judgment call here, move on to the next thing. Um, and below that was a chat. So you're constantly talking to mission control on a walkie talkie. Um, there's a like cell phone down there. We had started out using that to communicate back and forth. You can see I have an iPad in front of me. I'm getting text messages, things like that. It was fairly intense the first day. And I felt like I was like, just really, you know, it was like a trial by fire. I got into this and, you know, realized I'm responsible for directing what's going on. And we were also that day testing out new, you know, the, this piece of equipment that was one of the ones that had 14 steps or maybe even more for, um, for how, you know, how you would execute that plan. So, you know, I was going back and forth, looking at the instructions, being able to talk back to the, the divers. In the meantime, the, the group back on shore who was uh, responsible for diver safety are talking as well. And so um, it was a lot, you know, a lot of communications going on. And I will say one other thing. There was one day that we did um, a practice, a kind of a loss of, um, loss of communications with back with mission control. So we were responsible for just running the whole thing for 30 minutes. But it, by then we had been I'm in the mission, you know, four or five days, we were feeling pretty comfortable about all of this. And this was mission control back at the, um, the base station in um, Isla Morada and Tavernier. And lots of people sitting around watching playbook. They're able to see uh, what I'm able to see as well, as well as the kind of a map over on the right-hand side of where the, the divers are, are, are supposed to be. And so in that room are a lot of the contractors who had um, equipment that was being tested, a lot of NASA people who were in charge of, of making sure that this mission was successful. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the tools and the and equipment that we used. So, and again, don't worry about all of that um, writing on there. Um, I think this is recorded, so if anybody's interested, you'll be able to go back and read all of it um, later. But basically, we were testing tools for collecting samples, um, primarily um, for what I'm going to be focused on today is a, a core sampler. Um, and then um, the transportation system, the, the METS or the underwater wheelbarrow with lots of different and some other samplers as well. And then the lower right was just some, I'm not gonna go into it in detail um, today, but the European Space Agency had developed a system for um, uh, to be able to take a disabled diver, someone who, a disabled, disabled um, astronaut and be able to uh, transport that astronaut back to the base station. So they were testing that equipment as well. And that was pretty cool. Okay, so METS, the modular equipment transport system basically allows us to take equipment from one location to the other. And the reason we needed that is because on any particular dive, we might be doing you know, four or five different things. And so um, to be able to, you could go to one area, have all your stuff in the, in the wheelbarrow, the METS, and then take it out as you needed. But our expert tool development team at the Johnson Space Center really developed a lot of very cool tools and modules for that. And um, here we're looking at it. This is, we had um, training session. Oh, there's a picture of Mary. I was looking for a picture of Mary today. The woman in the center was one of the, the Mary Walker was one of the uh, tool developers. And so there we were just kind of getting the lay of the land on what the METS looks like and the different, um, um, you know, modules that would that would go in there and how to get those out. And we did practice. We had um, training at the Johnson Space Center. We actually had two training sessions at the Johnson Space Center because we had one in 2018 when we thought the mission was going to be in 2018, and then another one in 20, um, 2019 as well. Um, okay, so um, one of my favorite tools was the drill. 
Um, I'm not a power tool person, but this was very, very cool. And here you see Samantha Cristoforetti, our commander, looking at the, the tool. We have got to practice it, practice using it. And you can see the, the, the module into which the, the um, drill fits and uh, what are called sample blades, which I'll show you in a minute. And um, there are the aquanauts um, in action using, using the drill. We used um, these, the little um, white things that other things are attached to, like look like syringes, are called sample blades. And so we had regular syringes that we could use to collect water samples, but we had some that were modified. And the one really high tech um, device that we used, which was over on the right hand side, was a pillbox that we modified because I wanted to take core samples of these sponges and then, um, and then evaluate them, test them a few days later. And so we needed to transport them back to Aquarius to what was called the staging area. And this again was all, you know, some, these were all things that NASA really wanted to be able to, to, to uh, test as well, evaluate as well. Can you collect a sample? Can we develop the, the tools and the devices that we need, the containers that we need to carry the samples back to the, the you know, the, the base station and then work on them? This was probably one of my most favorite things that I did down there. Um, it was called the Draper, in fact, it was the most favorite thing, um, Draper Real-Time Performance Monitor. And um, I was awful at this on shore, uh, you know, on land. And so um, this is Tristan from Draper, who's showing me how to use, how to do this. This was what I called the Lunar Lander. I am not in the generation that uses joysticks or video games. So it was totally foreign to me. But what we had to do was, was basically land, you know, this lander uh, safely on the moon. And the whole time we have to be uh, monitoring our fuel consumption, where we're going, hitch and yaw. I mean, you know, stuff that I was totally unfamiliar with. And I will, and, oh, and by the way, and at the same time, on the joystick were like two buttons, um, a blue one and then one that wasn't quite blue. So not much distinction between them. And in the lower right corner of that screen was, uh, were two concentric circles. And one of them was blue and one of them was supposed to be green, but you really couldn't tell the difference very well. And so you had, every time you saw that while you're doing three other things, you have to press the button. And, you know, and like I said, I was just absolutely awful at this. When I got an, um, in the habitat, I don't know what, I don't know why, but I was totally focused and um, was really able to, mul I don't know if it was the oxygen or what, but anyway, uh, pressure, whatever, but I was totally focused and I was able to um, pretty much ace this, I think almost every time. So, you know, you had to focus, where's the landing site, navigate around to get to that, making sure you're, you know, not going to crash land. What's my altitude? How do I control my descent? Oops, I'm using too much fuel. I only have 1% of fuel left and I still have 200 feet to go. And then those annoying circles that I was talking about. But this was my absolute favorite thing to do. I actually did extra ones because it was so much fun. We only had one of these um, um, setups. Um, and then I mentioned the scanning electron microscope, little tiny thing. Those of you who are familiar with electron microscopy, this is a teeny tiny little scanning EM. Um, I had a lot of fun with this as well. Um, this is one where I would probably have gotten extra credit too, because I did a lot of samples with this and really had fun um, using this. And then the, the developer of this, Chris Own, was able to see what I was doing. He was back at mission control, so we could... Um, I'm not supposed to say this because we weren't allowed to do that, but we could communicate with each other. Um, um, and I would be doing these things probably in the evening and say, Chris, what do I do about this? And he would, he would talk me through it or text me through it. Um, then we had a lot of things where we had to do kind of like your memory. I, I wasn't this great on these, any of these tests, but this one, one was one where you had to match. You'd select a pair of shapes that fit in with another shape. So, you know, in the lower right, you see that oval and you press on a pair of shapes that corresponds most closely with the shape that you're seeing. That was an easy one. There were ones that were much harder than that. Then there was one where it would show you a symbol 
And then you had to press the, and then down on the bottom, it showed what each one of those symbols corresponded to numerically and press the number. And so it would kind of, you know, put up another one again, timed also. And so your speed and accuracy. And again, I wasn't that great with that. Okay, the other thing that we did, um, both indoors for, uh, you know, intravehicular activity and extravehicular activity was this thing where you had to move pegs, I think I've got that, um, from a little well, little tiny pegs from a, little, from a well into those little slots timed, and you did it with your dominant hand. And in this picture, you can see me with my uh, non-dominant hand, my left hand, and again, timed. And the other thing you see on that, and I wanted to point out a few others. Can you go back one on that? Okay. On that table was, is um, two walkie-talkies, two cell phones, several coffee mugs, um, a little grip strength thing, because I had to do that at the same time. So there was lots going on. We were constantly multitasking. And um, what was really cool is that the uh, aquanauts would also have to do this during their dives as well, during the extravehicular activity. So they would do it at the beginning of the dive. And then after, even though it was June, the water was cold, after like a four hour dive, they would do it again. And again, just testing your, your ability to do it, speed, accuracy, and so on. This was the exercise module that, um, this was not one of my favorites. Um, and it was like this little contraption, well, a big contraption actually. And, but um, a group um, uh, had, uh, I think it was the University of San Diego. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't see the logo. But anyway, they developed the uh, protocol and developed um, these modules to kind of encourage the astronauts to want to like play a game while you're, while you're exercising. So one of them was that you had to, squat, do these things, and all of these involve squats, which are not my favorite exercise. And so you'd have to kind of like squat, and depending on how deeply you squatted or how quickly, you could kind of capture ships, but you had to avoid being struck by a, a, by a submarine. And there were, there were two, two games, and the other one was um, Heart Racer, and the goal of that was to catch as many fish as possible. I had already decided early on that I was not going to do well at this, but there, you know, the, and uh, the other thing too, is that I was probably old enough to be uh, the mother or grandmother of the other three um, women and the, and the other three uh, female aquanauts as well. So they were, you know, pretty gung ho and were able to do these exercises really well. So I want to talk about the marine science objectives. Um, the reason that I was down there and it was to look at, um, to test some, um, technologies that were developed with support from NOAA through our Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology. And one of them was, um, and in fact, the whole reason I got involved in NEMO in the first place was because of David Fries. David was giving a seminar during one of our Cooperative Institute annual meetings, and he said, oh, um, I want to, you know, I've been given the opportunity to test this in Aquarius, but I don't know how to dive. Does anybody want to do that? And I'm like, oh my God, I'll do it. So that's how I got actually got involved in, in this whole Nemo, um, you know, adventure. Um, and so we went through a lot of iterations um, to develop this tool, which is called, which we called Stinger. And the whole idea be behind Stinger was, because um, I, for many years, um, decades actually, had been doing collections with a Johnson Sealing sub and got spoiled because we could collect samples really carefully and easily. And then when we had to transition over to remotely operated vehicle co collections, it took a long time. And so, you know, I kept thinking to myself, we, there's got to be a way where maybe we could do like kind of a needle biopsy sampler where you could go up to a sample, extend your manipulator arm, get your sample put it back in a fixative and bring it back and not spend you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes collecting a sample. So I started working with um, David Fries at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. And together we worked on um, different iterations of, of this tool. And you can see in the upper panels, the upper two, you can see the kind of like a little biopsy tool. And the whole idea was to get a little tiny core, um, in this case of sponges. And then in the lower right, you can see the tool in action. And the two people with whom we worked most closely at IHMC were David Fries, the developer of this, and Connor Tate. And then I have to thank Don Liberatore as well, because he helped um, 
because of his um, experience and expertise in developing and you know, piloting the Johnson C. Link submersibles, developing tools for collections, was really able to add that expertise to be able to um, you know, revise and, and really perfect this, um, this instrument. The second objective was to look at um, bioerosion of coral skeletons by, by sponges. And um, the, this um, instrument, again, developed with support from NOAA through our Cooperative Institute, is the brainchild of Drs. Alina Smont and Rob Whitehead at our partner institution through our Cooperative Institute, the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And by the way, Alina's an aquanaut as, as well. 50 years ago, she was part of the all-female crew, tectite crew. Um, Anyway, so she developed this because she works on corals and was really interested in photosynthesis and respiration rates in corals, but it had never been used deeper than maybe about 30 or 40 feet and only on corals, not, um, not on anything else. So we uh, were interested in testing it on sponges. Okay, why sponges? Okay, so sponges, you can see that red patch is a, is a sponge. I would say it's a boring sponge, but then I always get this aren't all sponges boring and they're not. So it's a bioeroding sponge. And if you, if you were to crack that open on the picture on the right hand side, you would see how that sponge has actually gone and uh, bored into, eroded out the coral skeleton. So they can weaken coral skeletons, mollusk shells, oyster shells, for example. So the question is what's gonna happen in a more acidic ocean? So we were interested in testing this um, on a, some, a different organism than corals. NASA was interested in this because it's a complicated, you know, relatively complicated instrument that involved going back and forth between a couple of iPads, attaching the device, taking water samples. It was a complicated procedure. So they, in fact, it was NASA who requested um, the use of, of KISSME because they had used it before. And it's called KISSME because of this coral in situ metabolism, but also because of the way it, um, you put it on the corals, it gently kisses them and doesn't hurt the, the coral tissue. So the, the goal here was to take the kiss me measurements on an intact sponge. And then this is a sponge called Clyona deletrix. And the next would be to take core samples. So use that um, core sampler to take a kind of about a, maybe about a one centimeter, no, maybe more than a centimeter, a couple centimeters um, diameter core. And there, they are taking their samples. And then the next is to take those cores and incubate them for one to four days in that pillbox container that I showed you earlier. And then the next was to take the measurements of the core samples, the same measurements using the KISSME at the Aquarius staging area. So this is what the staging area looked like. And again, you see um, you know, the, the sleeves, the different modules, and I'm going to show you a few pictures of this because it was, I thought this was one of the really cool aspects of the, of the project. And it was one of the most challenging as well. We had, you know, we had, you know, issues as, you know, anytime you take something underwater, you might get a leak or you might, something might not work the way you expected it. This had only been used in shallower water. So when we got down to 60 or 70 feet, it was the pressure was pressing on this little film that was on the top of the iPads and, and it was, um, you know, causing, it was making it difficult to actually give commands on the iPad. So this was even on the first day trying to work through all of that. It was really, really interesting, but here you can see, and also NASA was interested in seeing uh, two person versus one person operation. So on the left hand side and the upper right, you can see two people doing the doing the um, kiss me measurements. And in the lower right, you can see JW, JW on her arm. That's Jessica Watkins. Jessica was totally amazing. She could whiz through all of these all by herself. And the only thing Jessica was afraid of was sharks. And um, she was, I guess somebody scared her ahead of time about sharks. And you could tell if she'd do some measurements and then she'd kind of like do a sweep, look around, make sure there weren't any sharks. Okay. Some of the highlights, uh, those of you who know me know that I'm a space junkie, I'm an astronaut groupie. I love anything you know, space related. So for me, when I found out that I was going to be doing this with, you know, and living and working with astronauts, I was just totally excited. So Samantha Cristoforetti was our commander. Uh, Samantha held the record for quite a long time as the uh, 
longest duration uh, mission on the space station for a female, uh, Jessica. And uh, so Jessica on the lower left uh, was, uh, you know, was an astronaut candidate selected, I think out of eight, you know, there were 12 people selected out of 18,000 applicants. She was amazing, absolutely amazing. Look, at, look, watch for her. I have no doubt she'll be on a, uh, a mission to moon pretty soon. And I just wanted to bring up, because I'm going to have bragging rights on this, on the lower right is um, Victor Ike Glover. So Ike was supposed to be our commander if we had the mission in 2018. And when it got postponed for a year, he had to drop out. And my guess is the reason he had to drop out is because in about 10 days, I think that's November 14th, um, Ike is going to be um, on the Crew Dragon uh, 1 mission to the space station. So totally excited about that. Other highlights, the neutral buoyancy lab at the Johnson Space Center. It's a pool about 100 feet by 200 feet by 40 feet deep. And in the pool is a replica mock-up of the International Space Station. So it's used to train astronauts um, to work on the International Space Station. It's also the place where we had to do our swim test, um, which was um, pretty impressive. <laughs> So jumping in there and doing our swim test. But that was definitely a highlight. And I remember I had seen this several years ago. I'd been there several years ago and I thought, oh, one day I would really love to get in there. And I got that wish. Um, mission control, I didn't even need a heading for this. Again, for an astronaut, you know, groupie, space junkie, for me going to mission control was like, you know, a trip to Mecca. So um and Mary Walker, my, my buddy for the swim test, um, took me on a tour of, of mission control. And there were actually stuff happening in there. They were monitoring stuff that was going on in the space station as well. Um, and we had the opportunity, NASA set this up so that we could talk with the astronauts who were on the space station while we were um, in, in Aquarius. Re and we were on with them for probably about a half an hour. It was really, really incredible. Okay. so. Some frequently asked questions, so I'm going to answer those right off the bat. So um, I know I'm getting short on time. Okay, where is the bathroom? Okay, so you can see on the lower right there's an arrow, that little area there, and you can see there's a viewport over to uh, uh, there as well. It's right in the wet porch area. There's like a little shower curtain, and you go in there, and that's where you go to the bathroom. There's a toilet, and take your shower. Now I'm going to tell you something here. There, because there was such a delay in getting everything ready, one of the last things that they were going to put in the habitat was the toilet. And we four female crew members said, if you don't get the toilet in, we're not going to go down. Because otherwise, we would have had to dive, go out and take care of our business out uh, in this other gazebo area, which none of us were planning on doing. Now you also see that there's another red arrow on the bottom. There's another toilet uh, that we could use during decompression, only again, kind of with a, just a shower curtain in front of it. Um, because during decompression, the entry lock is sealed off and the wet porch is still um, exposed to kind of you know, ambient, um, ambient pressure. So we couldn't use the bathroom that was in the wet porch area. Um, and then while we're on this slide, I also wanted to show you just kind of opposite the decompression toilet was um, a sink, which is where we washed our face and hands, brushed our teeth, cleaned our cameras, did all that kind of stuff as well. And then on the far left um, was our bunk room. So six bunks, um, I, the two um, habitat Technicians get the two bottom bunks in case they have to jump up in a hurry. I was on the, I had the old lady bunk, the second one up. Um, and then there were, um, and then the, the two youngsters, Jessica and Chilla were on the top. Um, okay, where did you sleep? Okay, so I just showed you where we, uh, told you where we slept. This is what it looked like. And during the day, um, because space was at a premium, we used uh, our bunks for doing some of the, the tests that we were doing, the neurocognition tests, things like that. This is a picture of Tom Horn, one of the habitat technicians uh, working on my bunk. And for those of you who've traveled with me, you know that I hate it when people put stuff on my bunk, but we you deal with it. What did you eat? We ate mountain house foods, um, which were not bad. Actually, there were some that we you know, discovered were favorites, kind of like a raspberry crumble was just luscious. 
um, had you know chicken, mashed potatoes, things like that. Um, just boiled water, added it, and um, that was our dinner. However, I will say that every now and then we got gifts from the surface. And so one day we got pizzas. Uh, one day we got a key lime pie, we got fresh fruit, and we got some candy as well. So that was pretty cool. Uh, could you talk to family and friends? Oh, heck yeah. Um, we, first of all, that, ca that's, that image there is a camera, um, an image from a screenshot from a video camera. So there are video cameras almost everywhere, not in the bunk room, obviously not where you could see us taking showers, going to the bathroom, but pretty much every place else we were on candid camera the whole time. And we could text, we could email, we could um, talk by phone as well. So um, it, was, it was pretty, you know, we, we stayed um, probably more connected than we probably want to be. How do you get things down to aqu Aquarius without getting them wet? Okay, so you put them in Ziploc bags and then you put them in these things that look like pressure cookers or pots. And then there, the, the, um, the Aquarius crew then take them down to, um, to the habitat and they have to be vented uh, when you get down there. But that's how we kept everything dry. So you know, watches, radios, everything, the scanning electron microscope, everything that had to be kept dry was what's called potted, potted down. Um, do you have to, did you have to decompress? Yes. So Aquarius is at the ambient pressure at 62 feet. So and that interior pressure is same as the pressure of the surrounding water, which is um, a little more than twice the surface pressure. So at the end of the mission, we had to decompress for about 18 hours inside Aquarius. So they sealed it off and then it was brought, the Aquarius itself stayed on the bottom, but the pressure inside was brought to surface pressure. Once that happened, once we were at service, it took 18 hours. At, at the end of that, it was pressurized again, back down to 62 feet. They opened up the, the hatch and then we went out and swam up to the surface, just like a scuba dive. I mean, we had a tank on obviously mask and snorkel, our scuba tank. Um, this is just a picture of um, three of the four of us because I couldn't reach around and take a picture of Jessica who had, was in the bunk above me. But this was the first hour of the, of the decompression where we had to um, breathe oxygen for short periods of time over a, a, a one hour period. I think that's what it was. Oh, and I forgot to mention also that we had doctor visits. Um, we, we, the, the doctor came down and checked us out every couple, three days and every day talked to us to make sure that we were feeling okay. Um, there are lots of people I wanna thank. Um, these are the people I worked with most closely um, during the preparation, year and a half or so preparation. Um, um, Kristen, it, these were the, 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 the folks in the gray t-shirts uh, or gray polo shirts were all NASA folks uh, who uh, really uh, guided us through all aspects of this. We had regular meetings. And the two people on the right-hand side are Mary Walker and Adam Nades. Um, Adam, you already were introduced to. He was one of our, he was our alternate crew member and they were just um, a delight to work with in terms of tool development. Um, it, it takes an army. There were lots of partners and collaborators. Um, and here's a, a, just a, a shot of representatives from most of those organizations. I wanna, give special thanks to my support team who was back on shore taking care because every night the instruments would be taken back to shore. And so um, Don would be responsible for, you know, downloading the data from the Kiss Me, cleaning it up, recharging the batteries, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, the Sponge Girls, um, uh, Megan, uh, Andia, uh, Cassidy, Elizabeth, Chris, uh, all worked back at the uh, science van and at um, mission, mostly in the science van, and then back at our, the, where they were living um, during this mission to kind of help get all the gear ready, download data, do all of that kind of stuff. I can't thank them enough. Um, Jim Masterson manned the um, Exploration Command Center back here, and also Jim, thanks for the slides that you provided. Uh, Jimmy Nelson in terms of our dive safety and the FAU communications group. Um, okay, Dennis mentioned the bucket list. So on my bucket list were to dive the Mariana Trench. Got that done a few years ago um, by ROV. I didn't get to actually dive in a submersible. Dive under the ice in the Antarctic. What? No. 
too cold. That was uh, like on my bucket list a long time ago, but decided I didn't want to do that anymore. Do an Aquarius mission, check. And see the Grand Canyon. Yeah, I know I have, and I've been all over the place, but so maybe next year, and this is kind of an inside joke, but thanks Alan Leonardi. Um, Alan's the director of ocean exploration and research at, at uh, NOAA. And um, he was the one who allowed me to um, modify one of our projects, the Stinger project, so that I'd be able to um, participate in this mission. So thanks, Ellen. Alan, he did tell me that he couldn't help me get to the Grand Canyon though. And with that, I think that's it. Questions? Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks for participating in this first virtual uh, ocean science lecture. And I'll try, sorry I went a little bit long, um, but it's not like everybody's gonna go out for dinner, right? You all, all ordered in and did takeout. Okay, and hopefully for the last hour, you've been able to get your mind off of the current events. So I hope I at least did that for you today. Thanks very much. Well, Shirley, I don't know if uh, everybody you can hear all the applause. <laughs> Lots of we have one, we have yeah, we have a person in here, and he applauds. Okay. And, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, Shirley and I are actually next to ex different rooms. That allows her to be uh, unmasked during the presentation because we we have certain COVID rules that we do follow. Um, so Shirley, you got a bunch of interesting questions here. Okay. I'm going to take them more or less in the order they, they came in. Okay. Um, can you estimate your total lifetime underwater time, including scuba and JSL dives? Oh my gosh. Drive back and forth to New Jersey and you have nothing else to do. And you say, how many hours? How many, oh gosh. Well, let's say, let's just say if it was like, let's say I did 300 JSL dives and each one of those was say maybe three, let's just say three hours or four hours. So there's, 900 hours right there. And then I probably have, I don't know, 800 scuba dives. Um, some of the deep dives were short, but so I would say probably, I don't know, maybe probably, I don't know, 1500 hours. To, I don't know, I didn't do the math right. Um, but a long, it was a lot, it was a lot, but it was over a long time too. I started diving um, 50 years ago. Where was your first dive? Uh, off, my first dive was a checkout dive, and I hate to tell you this, it was off of Asbury Park in New Jersey. Dennis, you know where that is. I and do. it was a beach entry dive, and it was in April. I didn't have a wetsuit on. I had cut off jeans, because that was the style that those days, and a sweatshirt. <laughs> and the visibility was about six inches, and it was awful. But my next dive after that, and the reason I got certified, was so I could um, dive during a field trip that um, I took to um, the Virgin Islands when I was in college. Um, so Madeline, who um, you know from the visitor center, has a question. Uh, you said that you had experience being in confined spaces for periods of time. How did the other people in Aquarius feel about the tight quarters? Yeah, so the two, um, the two habitat technicians had been doing this for a long time, so they were fine with it. Chilla, I think, was fine. We didn't have, we really didn't have any problems. Of course, um, Samantha had been on the space station for, I think, uh, uh, more than 100 days, almost 200 days. So she, because she held a, a record for a dur long duration um, mission. And Jessica had been in training as an astronaut. So nobody, there was, I, I, no one ever complained about the close quarters. Only when we were trying to stow things and then find things that we had put away. But other than that, um, mm, no, nobody was claustrophobic. You probably remember Nolan Barrett. No, no. Oh yeah, hi Nolan. Yeah, Nolan has a question. How have the biological samples that were collected been used since the mission? How are these collections analogous to those scientific investigations planned for space? So the, um, we were most interested in finding out whether or not there was a difference, Nolan, because we had two of those two sponges. One has symbionts um, photosynthetic symbionts and one does not. So we were really interested in just testing that technology to see if it would work for, for you know, for sponges. And it actually, it, it actually worked well. So it helped the developer of that, Alina Smont and Rob Whitehead to tweak their system as well, make modifications in the tablet 
and also to be able to, uh, in fact, they adapted some um, holders for samples. So now it, it can be um, adapted for use in, in, um, in other, for on other types of organisms and other environments in deeper water as well. So it was a real proof of concept for, for them as well. Uh, okay, here's another question. Um, well, I think the first part, and you may have ans answered in your lecture, but how, how long, how many hours uh, duration were the um, were the uh, dives, you know, from the Nemo? Yeah. So, uh, kind of a totally different question. Did you use wake up call musics as they do in the space mission? You know, when the astronauts are going around, they always get their own special music. It's kind of themed and so on. No, you know, we we didn't. And in fact, they we were busy all the time too. In fact, they even said bring some movies so that you could watch movies during the 18 hour decompression. We slept for most of the, well, not most of the time, probably six hours. Uh, but no, we didn't have wake up calls. So generally my, my day began, the two habitat technicians would get up really early. And then I get up right after they did because so then I could run in, take a shower before everything, you know, before everybody was up and people were watching the, you know, through the video and then get back in and you know get dressed. And then the other um, three aquanauts would uh, get up and we'd start you know, pretty early. I mean, so, and, and to answer the first part of that question, the dives were about you know, four hours, sometimes five hours. And from start to finish, like getting ready for it and then getting back in um, and you know, doing the dive and then coming back in, it was, it was uh, you know, a long time. The, um, the, they were pretty, they were cold when they come, came back into the habitat. We had hot water. One. How did you dry off after dives? Um, some towels. <laughs> <laughs> Go in and take a hot shower and then towels. Oh, but that was the other thing. We got, uh, we had clean towels potted down to us as well. So we could take our dirty towels, put them in a you know bag and pot them back up to the surface. Because every day there were, I didn't mention this, but every day there were divers who were coming down and observing, watching what was going on, uh, you know, divers from NASA and from the European Space Agency and some from some of the contractors who would come down every day. So there was activity there every day underwater and they would bring down you know, fresh towels. They weren't warm towels, but they were fresh towels. This is from Greer. Greer's one of our graduate students. Hi, Greer. Hi, Greer. And um, um, besides saying, so cool, you got to do this. How, have, have you had time to publish your findings with the Boring Sponge Project? Can you give us a little taste for the results? No, we haven't done that yet. We're kind of working closely with Alina and Rob at UNCW. And what I'd like to do, and Greer, of course, of course you know about this because your advisor is Andia, who's working on Clyona Delitrix. So what Andia and I are hoping to be able to do is to actually now that we've worked out the system for using the Kiss Me on um, on the on the bioeroding sponges to be able to go back and and now actually plant some more experiments based on the results that we got. So no, we've not published on that. We have published on the tool development for the Stinger, um, and it hasn't been published yet, but it's been submitted for publication. Were you bothered by sharks? Or, or any other marine organisms during your project? No, I, you know, I didn't even see any sharks when we were down there, but what was really cool and what was, the, you know, one of the you know, like fun things was that you could look out the portholes. There was a big porthole by our table. And then there was another porthole in our bunk room, which was kind of, you know, you could, that would be the last thing you would see at night. You could look out, there were two uh, Goliath groupers that were, that were there all the time. Um, we'd have rays that would come in, um, and Chilla worked on rays, so it was really exciting for her to see the, the rays. Lots of fish, especially at night when we had lights on, the fish would, there'd be lots and lots of fish. Um, but no, we really, uh, um, barracudas, um, but no, we weren't bothered. Um, we weren't bothered by anything, and I don't think anyone got kind of stung by fire coral or anything either. Of course, we had really, they had thick, thick gloves that they wore too. We were totally covered. Can you think of any drawbacks with the Aquarius analog missions? Um, 
Well, I, you know, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I can't, you know, I, there are certain things you can do with the Aquarius as an analog mission that, that you might not be able to, that wouldn't be all the functionality you would need for planetary exploration. But, you know, I'm sure there are, um, you know, the, you know, be nice to have like different food. Although the, I have to say the food wasn't bad. I lost weight. My cholesterol level went down. It was not bad at all. Um, so no, I don't think so. It's, it, these, the, you know, the Aquarius guys have this set pretty well. They've been working with NASA for many, you know, 23 years. And so they really refined this, honed this so that, um, you know, NASA can get out of it with what they need and be able to, to test things. And conversely, Aquarius is getting, you know, being able to develop some new tools and equipment and instruments as well to make their um, non-NASA operations work smoothly too, more smoothly. Okay, the next one is, uh, did the Kismet do well um, then at 60 to 70 feet? I guess, did it actually give you what you wanted? Yeah. Did they have to make modifications for the greater depth? So did they did they have to do anything differently? Because you had implied in your talk that they yeah. had. So we tried. Um, there was a lot of fit, you know, like a tweaking that went on. And uh, I should bring Don up here and have him talk about it, but he's going to be shaking his head no. Um, there was a lot of tweaking that went on because it hadn't been used in that deep water. So there were the problems with that film um, pressing on the the tablet uh, you know, monitor and, and also using like the astro, what I call the astronaut gloves, they're only thick, the, these thick gloves and trying to, you know how it is trying to, you know, if you have fat fingers trying to type something out. So trying making sure that you're typing and not ty uh, hitting another, um, you know, another button on the, on the uh, iPad. Wait, Oh, problems with a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, I forgot about that. So there was a Wi-Fi connection um, between the handheld unit and the KISME, and there were problems with the Wi-Fi connection as well. But we worked, not we, Don worked closely with um, Rob and Alina uh, pretty much, you know, every day saying, okay, what can we do to tweak this? And in the end, it was, it, it were, you know, I was, I, I have to say on the first day, I was a little worried because you know, that was like my trial by fire, trying to, you know, get a feel for all of those monitors, the different walkie talkies who I was talking to. And at the same time, we were having problems with a kiss me, which was like, you know, a, a major instrument. And I, and I remember at one point, you know, I tried everything and you're supposed to be self-sufficient. I was trying, trying, trying everything. And then at one point, I, I really distinctly remember because there was a video camera that I know and mission control wasn't, wasn't helping. Nobody was helping. Um, and I remember turning around and just, shrugging my shoulders like, I don't know what to do next, but you do it, you just, you know, work through it. But by, you know, we, we kept working on that and tweaking the system. And so by the, you know, by the end, um, you know, we were running two units doing two sets of samples, one person doing that back and forth. It was, it, it, I, it, you know, I was really very pleased with the outcome of it. So it was a lot of, um, you know, um, even tweaking and tool development and process development during that during the mission. So I think it provided valuable feedback to Alina and Rob. And the, by the way, these KISMEs are deployed. She, um, they've got probably at least a half a dozen of them that are deployed around the world. So it's just it's not you know it's 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 actually been you know it's at a, a very high readiness level. It's been it's been used in the field. Okay, this one is um, getting back to housekeeping stuff. But apparently, it's someone that knows you pretty well. Here it goes. <laughs> Did everyone do their part in keeping your quarters clean? Speaking from experience with you, now I am reading this. this is, speaking from experience uh, with you, I know you are a stickler. Wait, that could be like 50 <laughs> people. Anyway, um, yeah, everybody, I will say that I probably, there were probably a, a couple of us who wash dishes more than others. But by the same token, you know, I wasn't, you know, they, they, they may have been diving for five hours or something. But no, you, had, you pretty much had to clean up after you, you, whether it was something you ate or drank or your bunk. Your bunk had to be made up every day because we were using it as kind of like, you know, 
benches, you know, for our for the the tools that we were testing and the, the different things we were doing, the different tests that we were doing, the psycho psychological tests, the motor skill tests. So everything had to be clean. And if you used a piece of equipment that somebody else had to use, you had to pack it up, put it away so that the next person who had to use it could find it. So they were, it was pretty good. It was, it was like team building um, training? Mm -hmm. Yes. Training? I yeah. mean yes, definitely. And we had their surveys and questionnaires, you know, about how you feel about, you know, I guess, you know, I guess when you're on these long duration missions that it, you know, it, it, it could get, it could get challenging. We really had no, there were no personality conflicts, no personality issues at all. So we all got along really, really well. We had fun. Um, and so when we would have to answer these questions, like, you know, that had to do with like, you know, somebody bothering you, it's like, what are they talking about here? But, you know, so, um, but you know, there was a lot of, um, team building support for your, you know, your buddy, your dive buddy, the person you may be doing an experiment with and so on. So that was all part of it as well. This is from Reg Jones, who is a very long-term uh, regular for the lecture series. I noticed your bucket list does not include a trip to the space station. Would you like to go into space? <laughs> um, if I didn't have a heart attack on takeoff, probably. <laughs> But I, it's interesting that you say that because, um, I can't see that now, but that's okay. It's interesting that you say that because um, just the other day I was talking to my husband, Don Liberatore, and um, I said, you know, I kind of think I would like to do that now, but I don't think I'd ever survive um, takeoff. Plus I get seasick. It's okay, Wyatt, I don't need that. I get seasick, I get motion sick. so. I, I'm not sure, you know, how I would fare up there if I got motion sick, but it, but, you know, it, it would be pretty cool to be able to do some experiments in space. This might be our last one because we're just about out of time. Um, do you ha have, it, it basically was, did you have an emergency action plan in place? And I'm, sh I'm sure they did, but you might want to tell us a little bit more, you know, about that. Yeah, yes, there was, a, there is definitely an emergency action plan in place. Um, this was in June, so it wasn't that much of an issue about um, kind of hurricanes, which when we're here at Harbor Branch, we think about, you know, the hurricane emergency action plan, but things that we, but, and of course we would have to decompress, but if we had to get out of there in a hurry, there was a decompression chamber on the, the boat, the ship, that, the boat that came back and forth. And so if we had to get out of there in a hurry for any reason at all, we would basically, you know, probably get a little bit bent, but, you know, scuba dive up to the surface and immediately get in. It's a large decompression chamber. They had one on the, sh on the boat, and then they had a really big one back at the reef base back on, um, on shore. Um, plan for fire, um, plan for if you got trapped, is there another play way to get out and escape? And, you, and if something had happened in the habitat, we were trained on how you get out of the habitat, basically from our bunk room, swim out and go to this gazebo area where you could pop up and there's you know air in there and so you could breathe. So um, different kinds of emergency plans were definitely, um, definitely in place. Did you spend a lot of time down there thinking about having to go to the surface on such short notice? Never, I didn't think about it once. Not so after a like while, does everybody do you kind of just settle in and you kind of forget yeah. you're actually yeah, you kind of settle you could be in, in I, your lap. Pardon? You could be back in your lab at some point. Did you feel? Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, it was pretty. You know, I was pretty calm. Leading up to it was pretty stressful for me. I, um, I I'm not a strong swimmer. I stressed like crazy over the swim test. Um, uh, you know, I just, it was a, it, we had a lot of training going on, a lot of things being thrown at us. By the time we got down there, it was just nice to be away from it all. And there was just the six of us down there. And basically, you know, even though we communicated back and forth to shore, we could disconnect from that. And the one thing that I found that was most remarkable for me was that I, and I mentioned this before when I talked about that exercise, the lunar lander thing that I really enjoyed doing. I felt really calm and focused, um, not flustered at all. And those of you who know me know that, you know, when things are thrown at me a lot at a time, I'll, I'll start getting a little hyper about that. 
I, it wasn't like that at all in, in the habitat. So for me, it was a really nice, you know, like kind of learning experience about, you know, things like behaviors I could take back to shore with me. You want to do another Aquarius mission? I would do another. I think I would do another Aquarius mission. I, if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have said no, um, because it was just so much preparation and so much stress. And I'm looking uh -huh. at Don right now, and he's like, he has like, he's because he worked. He and the the rest of the team here at at Harbor Branch FAU worked really, really hard. It was a lot of work. I mean, basically, they didn't start their day until we were finished ours. And so, you know, they'd be working you know, really late hours and then have to get up early to get the equipment on the boat that was coming back out to the habitat. Um, so it was, you know, and then being in the science van for during the, during the mission to help, you know, answer questions that came up. So it was, um, it was really a lot of work for the, my, you know, the, the shore based team as well, but um, yeah, I'd, pr I'd probably do it again. Well, we'll find it would be kind of fun. It would be kind of fun, Dennis. Don't you think it would be kind of fun if you and and uh, John, and, you know, the the A team yeah. got went down there and did some stuff. I almost did. I almost did one, but Hurricane Hugo many years ago uh, got in the way. <laughs> yeah. So Shirley, I want to thank uh, you for everybody here, uh, the audience. We had a really nice turnout. I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, speaking of teamwork at Harbor Branch. I want to thank all the people behind the scenes who helped us get this going on the technical side. You know, it was our first time to do a, uh, a lecture this way virtually. And as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, we'll continue to do this, you know, until, until times change. But we think it's really important to connect with you all. So again, thanks, Shirley, for uh, giving us that. And we look forward to your next talk. I'm not sure if it's going to be in the Grand Canyon or what quite yet, but thank you, Shirley. I'm going to clap for everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you all.